Good afternoon, and welcome to the 54th program of the Harlan E. Boyles Distinguished CEO Lecture Series. Walker College of Business sponsors this event on our campus each semester, and as a result, many students have greatly benefited from contacts made with the distinguished business leaders who give up their time to the students. Students, you make this event special with your attendance. Please stay for the entire program. Student ID cards will not be scanned until the end of the program. It is now my pleasure to introduce our platform party. Today's featured speaker, Mr. Jim Blaine, President and Chief Executive Officer of the State Employees Credit Union. Senator James T. Broyhill, former North Carolina U.S. Representative and Senator. <laughs> Mr. Edward Boyles, Managing Director, Wells Fargo Securities. <laughs> and Dr. Sherry Everts, Appalachian State University Chancellor. Several of our guests will be available at the reception that will immediately follow the lecture if you would like to meet with them. That will be on the other side of the curtain behind us. At this time, I would like to introduce Senator Broyhill, who worked very closely across party lines and became close friends with Harlan Boyles. Senator Broyhill will give a brief history of the series, but just a little bit about him first. Senator Broyhill served for 24 years as a United States Congressman and Senator representing North Carolina. He chaired the North Carolina Board of Economic Development and was Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Commerce. While Commerce Secretary, North Carolina was the number one state in the nation for attracting new and expanded businesses and jobs. Senator Broyhill has also been an asset and a friend to Appalachian State University. He served nine years on the University Board of Trustees, is a former member of the Foundation Board of Directors, the Appalachian Summer Festival Advisory Board, and was honorary co-chair of the Athletics Facilities Enhancement Committee. He was named an honorary alumnus of the university by the Appalachian Alumni Association in 2000. Please welcome Senator Broyhill. Thank you very much, Dean Norris. I'm uh, just delighted to be here at the 54th Boyle's Lecture. Goes back a long ways. It was mentioned this morning that perhaps I may have had something to do with the formation of this great event, but I want to set the record straight that it was then Dean Ken Peacock, who had the vision for this uh, lecture series, and he appointed a committee for the purpose of, of creating uh, the speaker's event, event and also of, of coming up with the, uh, uh, raising the money for it. And the committee composed of two people, Dean Peacock and me. <laughs> We didn't have a lot of people to have to consult. But I can tell you this, that as then Dean Peacock and I sat down to talk about this uh, uh, plans for this event, we wanted to make sure that it bore a name of a person who stood for excellence, uh, for integrity, and also for accomplishment. And we immediately, both of us, thought of our good friend Harlan Bowles, who was at that time serving as the treasurer of North Carolina. In your program, there are listed uh, some facts about Harlan Boyle, but it does not go far enough, and I could spend a lot of time talking about uh, his history. 
Harlan passed away a few years ago, and we miss him. When he was on campus, which he was here often, he would often uh, lecture to uh, classes at the Walker School of Business. As you know, Harlan was the treasurer of North Carolina. Uh, this office of treasurer had been in existence ever since colonial days. And the duties of the treasurer are awesome when you consider that he has not only billions of dollars a year to deal with and account for, uh, uh, but also over $75 billion of trust funds of which he has a, uh, a responsibility, a fiduciary uh, responsibility. And uh, in this job, Harlan was an, uh, often an advisor to governors as well as to the uh, legislature uh, regarding uh, spending and regarding uh, fiscal uh, issues. And I can assure you, having worked there in Raleigh for a while, that not only what Harlan views sought, but they were also uh, listened to. And I say that it was largely due to his good efforts and his good uh, sound thinking that North Carolina has enjoyed a AAA bond rating for these many years. The program notes do not reflect the fact that Harlan had to overcome some very great adversity in his lifetime. He was raised in a farming community in Lincoln County, a community called Vail, which is just north of, northwest of Charlotte. Then tragedy struck. He was, he was afflicted with polio. He was out of school for quite some time. And during that period, the only schooling uh, that he got was over here at the Little Mountain School, not far from here uh, at Cross North. But for the rest of his life, Harlan had to wear heavy metal braces and he had to use a cane or crutches in order to, to get around. But he told me that he knew that if he was going to survive, that he had to have some special education. So he enrolled in an accounting uh, degree program at UNC and on graduation uh, became a CPA. After private practice of some time, he was recruited by former treasurer Edwin Gill to come into the treasurer's office to become his deputy. On Edwin Gill's retirement, Harlan Bowles ran for the office, was elected, and was re-elected six more times by the people of North Carolina as the treasurer of the state. But let me read, I just mentioned that, I wanted to read to you, and these are in his own words, a story of Harlan's early days, a story that he said shaped his views on basic economics and his approach to carrying out uh, his duties of public trust. He said that Harlan's father, he said, ran a little country store in the Vale community. And here's what Harlan said. He said, I learned from my father in the dark moments of the Great Depression a lesson in basic economics which has managed my, ma which has guided my management of the state's money to this day. I went down to the store as a young lad. I went back to the cooler and help myself to a soft drink. My father called me aside. He told me that he had to sell three loaves of bread to make up for what that drink cost. My father explained that the drink cost five cents and they made only two cents on each loaf of bread. He said it was at that time that I learned to equate the benefits of something with the cost. Harlan earned universal respect for his conservative approach in the handling of the state's monies. I had the pleasure of working closely with him when I was Secretary of Commerce. We worked in harmony together and over the years developed 
a very close personal relationship. That was the great attribute that Harlan had, and that is being able to bring people together. He was never an adversarial person. Uh, he always urged those in position of, of authority to make the key decisions based on what was good for the people of this state and not because it was just a good a political decision. So, my friends here in the audience, it's in conclusion, this is just a very short picture of a man who overcame great adversity to become one of the, to achieve great prominence in our state. And over the years, we hope that this story, the story how he overcame adversity and his exemplary service to the state, we hope that it does give continued inspiration and encouragement, not only to the students, but to the friends of the university for many decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Broyhill. We greatly appreciate your insight and your leadership. Thank you. I would also like to thank our business leaders attending the CEO lecture today. We are very honored that these busy people are willing to take time to come to Appalachian to meet our students, faculty, and staff, and other guests to learn about the exciting things happening on the Appalachian State University campus. Our luncheon speaker earlier today was Mr. Mark Vintner, Managing Director and Senior, Economic, Senior Economist at Wells Fargo. He's responsible for tracking U.S. and regional economic trends and also writes for the company's monthly economic outlook report. Mr. Vintner's commentary has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and many other publications. I would like to ask Mr. Mark Vintner to stand and be recognized, please. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Edward Boyles will introduce our featured CEO speaker. Edward is the managing director and head of the Southeast Public Finance for Wells Fargo. He leads the Southeast Public Finance team, which includes Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. He has 23 years of experience serving government and nonprofit clients. He is also the son of the late Harlan Boyles, for whom this lecture series has been named. Edward. Thank you. It's uh, certainly very nice to be back on campus on such a beautiful day. So uh, also great to see a lot of good uh, familiar faces and uh, be a part of this. Uh, we do have a very special guest today. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Jim Blaine as our uh, speaker. He's president and CEO of the State Employees Credit Union. As you, many of you may know, the, uh, the State Employees Credit Union is a, certainly a major financial institution, a big part of the North Carolina finance scene as it has been for many years and plays a big role in the local economy. I have uh, some early memories, in fact, of uh, going to the, the, the local branch with my father to do whatever business he might have been doing back in the 60s as it might have been back then. So uh, anyway, it's an uh, important uh, institution. Look forward to hearing uh, from you uh, about the progress it's made. And, and uh, again, it is a, a big plus for North Carolina. If I may, I'll give a, actually a little plug for financial, financial institutions in general. And, uh, and Mark Fittner talked a little bit on this maybe today, but uh, I would say to you, the United States is very fortunate to have the strongest and healthiest financial institutions in the world. Uh, and, and I do think that's part of why the U.S. today is probably faring better than any other economy in any other country across the world. Certainly there's more to do, but uh, because we have strong financial institutions, we're in a better spot than, than others would be. So we're, we're blessed in that respect. But uh, the other plug I'd put in, and particularly for students to think about, is that uh, um, the job opportunities that, that are out there with these big financial institutions, and really all, all size financial institutions, might surprise you. I've been amazed at the variety of jobs there are within these companies. Uh, you know, there's marketing, there's human resources, there's legal department, there's compliance. There's a number of areas within these companies that uh, don't require you to be a numbers person or, or, or your classic banker. So 
I would just say to you as you think about things that uh, these, these type of companies, and again, being healthy is a good thing, they might have a type of uh, need that, that matches up with, with what you're considering down the road. With that said, I, I, I'm, I'm anxious to, to give you our speaker. Uh, Jim has, uh, uh, again, got a, a good long history of running the State Employees Credit Union, but maybe even better, uh, he's a good example of the fact that uh, good guys do finish first. And so, uh, Jim, please come up and uh, welcome to, to Appalachian. Chancellor Everts, Dean Norris, Senator Broyhill, and distinguished guest, the invitation to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon is indeed a great honor for me. But let's be frank, who in their right mind would refuse an offer to share a splendid fall afternoon in the beautiful mountains of North Carolina on the exciting, exhilarating, thrilling campus of Appalachian State University and with the ASU family. Certainly we are gathered today in the center of heaven, and if not, heaven cannot be far distant from this place. Would you please say amen? Thank you. I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege to recognize a few other people that I have with me today. Some of the most important people that are here today are some of the people that I work for in this area. And I'd like to introduce Mike Salzano, if he would just stand up and introduce the three or four of our managers in this area. Thank you. They're wonderful people to work with. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce Ben McClawhorn. Ben, if you'd stand. Ben is the reason that I'm here today. It was a moment of weakness, and he asked me, and I, can, I agreed to uh, participate. Ben is a longtime, decades volunteer with the State Employees Credit Union and has served in advisory roles in our branches and our loan review committee. He is... Uh, in the controller's office of the state of North Carolina. If you want to know how the budget works and where the bodies are buried, you need to talk to Ben McLawhorn. He is also one of your distinguished alumni from AS, alumnus from ASU, Ben McLawhorn. <laughs> and lastly, I'd like to, to introduce you to my best friend, person I have had very soft eyes for for 45 years, my wife, Jean. <laughs> Edward, I am well pleased with the very fine introduction you provided. Uh, but despite some glaring uh, gaps in, shall we say, factual authenticity and some despite some earnest efforts by the university to gloss over and at best somewhat checkered past of your speaker, I thought I would tell you the truth to start out. A correct characterization would be slightly balding, 
can be testing, has been known to argue, has at least one opinion on everything. His logic is often obscure. He seems at times to speak in tongues. His service on numerous committees, which are frequently mentioned, has been entirely unsuccessful. Your speaker has never served for more than one term on any committee and has without question never been reappointed nor reelected by his peers. My edu educational background, which is Carolina and Duke, is less a matter of graduation than of university parole in exchange for a written, notarized promise never to practice. His invitations to speak have been infrequent, and once heard, he has never been invited back. <laughs> I assume I will maintain that record today. So unfortunately, there you have it. Here we are. We'll just have to make the best of it that we can. Mr. Boyles, Edward, I personally knew your father, Harlan E. Boyles. For much of my early career, he was the treasurer of the state of North Carolina. He was a great leader, a fine man, a most distinguished servant of this state. He was the keeper of the people's purse, the state's top banker, a position of high responsibility and profound trust. Edward, your father wore the cloak of trust, that cloak of trust with both dignity and integrity. And he had a pretty guard, darn good temper too. So you know I knew him. And what was nice about the man, he was willing to use that temper when right required. He shared this counsel with me at one particularly important point in my career. He said, Mr. Blaine, credit unions are a good thing for the working people of North Carolina. And they seem to be catching on. You should know that as credit unions grow, other institutions will not be pleased. And those institutions are controlled by very powerful and influential people. Now, as you might imagine at that point, I was of course completely cowed, almost shell-shocked from such an insight of complete truth and honesty. But Edward, your father then added, Mr. Blaine, I will never publicly support credit unions. I am the state's top banker. I will never publicly support credit unions. I was feeling good about that time, right? Then he said, but I will make sure that they never hurt you unjustly. And Edward, your father honored his word and kept that commitment. And having this chance today to tell you that story personally and to acknowledge that debt to your father on behalf of North Carolina Credit Union members is why I am truly and profoundly honored be here today. In thinking about today and trying to imagine a message which might have some meaning to each of you, I was struck by two daunting dilemmas. The first dilemma was the diversity of an audience composed of distinguished alumni, accomplished administrators, a renowned faculty and staff, and a student body 
still very much under the influence. Still very much under the influence of idealism, enthusiasm, and hope for the future. Is there a central theme there? Is there a common message that one can bring to this group, this highly diverse group, something that would be important to each of you? The second dilemma was that this program, this moment in time, has been defined as a lecture. And I don't know about you, but if there's anything that I have never cared for is to be lectured to by anybody. I'm going to assume and take the privilege of assuming that you feel exactly the same way. So instead of a lecture, let's just take a few minutes to talk a bit. Let's just take a few minutes to talk about a few simple things, a few simple pr principles. And where shall we look for those few simple prin principles, those few simple ideas which may have importance to you at this moment in your life. Perhaps it's too easy to believe that our common theme can be found right here in the purpose for which we have gathered today and in the character of the public servant this lecture series seeks to remember and to honor. Harlan E. Bowles, North Carolina's premier financial steward. So what's a financial steward? Most of us view stewardship as a position of high trust and responsibility, a keeper of the gate, a faithful servant, a good shepherd. one who protects, one who puts purpose and principle above self. A position of discipline, a position of deference, a position requiring sound judgment, high integrity, and humility. Harlan Bowles was that kind of leader, was that kind of shepherd, was that kind of public servant, was that kind of man. Harlan Bowles would be embarrassed and quite frankly appalled by the low level of trust and the high level of contempt, contempt that the American people now have for the stewards of our financial sector. The failure of the United States financial system in 2008, and it was a failure, which brought the world to the verge of economic collapse, was at heart a failure of stewardship by our financial leadership. That lapse in leadership, that abandonment of principles was both intentional and purposeful, and it was criminal in many respects. Accidents on that scale just don't happen. So how did we arrive at this low state of affairs, this anything goes, this show no mercy, this take no prisoners, morass and finance? For surely, we know full well that when anything goes, everything goes. And everything did go in 2008 with catastrophic 
result. How did we descend from the faithful servant, good shepherd stewardship of Harlan E. Bowles to a financial system designed and rigged to prey upon those who have the least and know the least, to prey on the unsuspecting, to prey on the poor, to prey upon those who trusted in good financial stewardship. A financial system designed and rigged to prey upon real people. Quite often your fellow students, your colleagues and co-workers, your neighbors, your friends, your family, and your children. Who endorsed, who authorized, who plotted our departure from a balanced financial system of caveat emptor, buyer beware, to a financial system driven by the principle of buyer be damned? At what point and under whose authority was the word usury, usury which is simply the social ethical agreement that it is humanly unacceptable and unconscionable to sell a $2 bag of ice for $25 in the middle of a natural disaster, fully and socially understood, who authorized the concept of usury to be stricken from our moral financial vocabulary. When was the concept of usury, the idea that there are financial practices which are socially unacceptable, that there are financial practices which are fiscally irresponsible, that there are still a need for limits within our financial system, Prudential limits, gatekeepers, and good shepherds are still needed. When was that concept of financial fairness deleted from our moral compass as a society and as a nation? Many place blame with those who worship at the altar of financial deregulation those very vocal proponents and prophets of a free market. Yes, they are easy targets, but they are a convenient excuse, and that's all. In truth, there is absolutely nothing wrong with a free market system. In fact, it is a, an idea, a system, which we all should support and pursue. But there is one catch in the theology of a free market system. The catch is that for a market to be truly free, it must also be fair. A free market must be a fair market. And the American financial system leading up to 2008 was neither free nor fair, and we have harvested the results of our folly in full measure with as yet uncertain final consequences. But let's stop, step back from this demagoguery and harangue and look for the sources of our past financial delinquency. In our apparent abandonment of the principles of financial stewardship, there were perhaps three basic causes, three basic problems, which precipitated the financial collapse of 2008. Three causes, three problems, all of which remain with us today 
six years later. Three causes, three problems, three threats, three risks to your financial well-being and that of your family. All of which remain with us today. The three ideas I would like you to consider are one, a breakdown in the discipline of a social community. This idea is fairly simple. As financial institutions have consolidated, local individuals, entire communities, have lost their ability to apply moral and ethical pressure on their local financial institutions. Decisions and policies and practices are no longer formulated within the community that is being served. It is now difficult to confront a faceless, impersonal institution. That's a tough challenge at any time. It is difficult to find a forum in which to hold a financial institution accountable to the people and to the community which they serve. The balance of power has shifted away from the local accountability, potentially dire result. The second idea is that there is now a disconnect. There is a disconnect in responsibility between the financial professional and the individual, individual financial consumer, you and me. Financial instruments are now quite often packaged and resold worldwide as investments. The local financial professional no longer must live with the consequences of bad financial practices or with bad financial advice. A local institution is no longer required to eat its own cooking. The local professional is usually a party of the financial tra transaction for no more than 30 days. A homeowner stuck in an exploding mortgage is penalized for a lifetime. If a car maker, a crib maker, a food processor in the market provides an unsafe, faulty product into the market, that producer is held fully accountable and liable for any harm done. These reasonable rules of liability and responsibility, these rules of market fairness, no longer seem to apply in the financial sector. If, as a consumer, you and me, if, as a consumer, you are dumb enough to sign it, then buyer be damned. That's your little red wagon. That's your mistake. That's your problem. That's your responsibility. That's often your tough luck. The financial sector is the only profession which is not required to meet the first principle of every other profession. That principle is, as you know, first do no harm. In today's modern and moral anything goes financial marketplace, you, as a consumer, are simply an innocent, fragile flower waiting to be plucked. So, we have experienced the loss of discipline by the local social community, and we have created a disconnect between the financial provider and the consumer. 
a disconnect between the buyer and the seller. Two very bad omens for the discipline required of a financial steward. But the worst is yet to come. The third cause, and perhaps the only cause, for the debasement of our financial system is the willful destruction of that one idea, financial stewardship, which is why we're here today and where we started off. The bond of trust between the financial sector and the American consumer has been shattered by recent experience and with good reason. People no longer trust that our financial institutions are managed by faithful servants, good shepherds, disciplined with sound judgment, high integrity, and Humility. But let's take a quick look at this idea of trust and how it works and how it's lost. Most of us understand the issue of trust is a process where a trusted advisor takes care of our interests by notifying, by informing, by instructing and ultimately, by becoming our advocate in the financial marketplace. A good steward who assists us in making fair, wise financial decisions and who would do us no harm. This trust is a little more ambiguous, and it is a slippery slope because it always starts out innocent enough and can evolve from something that's seemingly innocent into something that is less than innocent. This trust often evolves from an initial effort to simply persuade, which may lead to an effort to cajole, which may lead to an effort to entice, and which may end up with an effort to deceive. In situations of trust, the human conscience can become a tractable little engine, can't it? And each of us, after all, very, very human being. What we see to persuade, we may lead to something different. So enough. What should you do? What should you do about this situation? Why join a credit union, of course. What, you thought you were going to get away without the commercial? For those of you who are unfamiliar with credit unions, a credit union is a locally owned, member-managed financial cooperative which provides financial services on a not-for-profit basis. Locally owned, member-managed, not-for-profit basis. Credit unions are governed by a locally selected board of directors who are elected on a one-member, one-vote basis. True democracy. doesn't matter who you are, what you're worth, where you come from, or what you look like. If you're a member, you're a full-fledged member with one vote to elect, your, to elect your directors. In North Carolina, those directors serve as volunteers. 
they serve without compensation. Credit unions, the premier model for good stewardship in the financial industry. I happen to work for a credit union which I believe practices what has just been preached. Socially responsible financial stewardship to the citizens of North Carolina. An institution whose mission statement, some of you heard that this, this morning, the mission statement of our organization is simply do the right thing. Do the right thing. Pretty simple idea. And yes, you and I do know the difference between right and wrong. Don't we? Harlan E. Bowles in his life stood publicly and often, as you heard, with great adversity for a free market in North Carolina. He was that faithful servant. He was that good shepherd. He was that disciplined gatekeeper, a good steward of high integrity, character, and principle. We all, we all should assure that his important legacy is never lost in this state. Thank you for your patience with me this afternoon. May each of you in the future remain under the influence of enthusiasm, hope, and idealism in your lives. And whatever course you take, whatever path, path you choose, to be a good steward. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for those very passionate words about financial stewardship. Mr. Blaine has graciously agreed to take some questions at this time for the, from the audience. I thought I stunned you pretty well. I would be happy to take questions if there are. Uh, Dean, sensing that it's a very beautiful day outside, I think I'll just sit back there. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's hard to see. There's a very bright light on us. Thank you. I hope somebody will repeat the question. All I heard was, what do you think about the emerging crisis? And I'm going, let's see which one. <laughs> uh, Oh, student debt. Uh, student debt, yeah. I was asking um, what you see happening with that and how um, increasing student debt and cost of higher education might affect the U.S.'s financial future. Uh, again, I am not particularly knowledgeable about student debt. I would tell you, you have one more minute, that North Carolina had the best system for managing student loans in the country called the North Carolina College Foundation, which was a cooperative in which banks and credit unions and universities participated for over 50 years and managed the different pools to make sure students got the, what they needed at the lowest possible cost and made sure it was affordable. Uh, two years ago, the debt, the federal, the student loan market was federalized by the uh, federal government. 
I don't think that that's going to be a very productive move, long range. I think, uh, I'll tell you what our organization is doing. We are working with a number of groups to reach the families, not while you're in school, but while you're in high school, and to work with the parents and to train them on what's affordable and what pool costs are and what a budget is and what works is so that we don't have these surprises four or six years later. Clearly there are, is bad advice out there where students are taking on enormous debt, certainly not at our public supported university, but at some others, and we need to shut that practice down if you don't get a quality education for a fair cost. I'm sorry that that wasn't an effort, but I think an answer, but the best solutions I see are that the repayment ought to be based on your income going forward. I think that makes a lot of sense in fairness. And you know you can't declare bankruptcy on that thing, don't you? So if you really you got with Mr. Broyhill and got some of his political folks together, if there is unfair student debt, it should be able to be discharged. If you were taken advantage of, you should not be required to pay that debt or any debt. Bad financial stewardship. The symbol of the Boyle CEO Lecture Series is the American Eagle. The Eagle symbolizes strength, gracefulness, keenness of vision, and power of flight. The CEOs who have served as our speakers possess these same characteristics. Jim, we're pleased to present you with this crystal and our appreciation of your comments and participation in the lecture series here today. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. That concludes the lecture for today. Please remember we are having a reception on the other side of the curtain here and students, scan above. Thank you. <laughs>